Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're discussing the fucked up Philippines. The fucked up Philippines. How long they've been fucked up, why they're fucked up, and... What's fucking happening now? Yeah, yeah. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Triple B. From the Adelbert's Brewing Company in Austin, Texas. Uh, Austin. I'm kind of excited about this one. I've, I, Adelbert's have done well for us before, haven't they? Well, we've had four of their beers, a 2.3, a 2.5, a 3.5, and a 3.7. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, not too bad. They're, they're, they're pretty, pretty good, actually. Pretty good beers. I'm, yeah. I'm excited about this. While John is trying to uh, figure out how to open that bottle, uh, we're going to talk today about, um, again, about the Philippines, but really about... Uh, American involvement in the Philippines uh -huh. and the effect it had and concentrate on two of their leaders. I want to talk about uh, Ferdinand Marcos and Rodrigo mm -hmm. Duterte. 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 I have the hardest time with that name. Uh, and, and kind of see if we can figure out exactly what's going on. It is spelled on. phonetically. You shouldn't have a problem with I, it. I, I want to roll the, the UE. Hooked on phonics didn't work for him. There's I, no you know, UE. I, I, I want to say... Duer Tete, and, and, oh, and, 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 and it's it's not uh, it's not correct. Uh, but anyway, so the Philippines. When we talk about about this area, what do you know about it already? Just kind of throw that out there and get us an opening. Filipinos live there. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So you, you you've got a lot. I I have a Filipino friend. You have a Filipino friend. Yeah, but no, uh, I know that they speak Tagalog, and Spanish, and English, mm -hmm. and Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the languages that they teach. A lot their of good pool players come out of there. Yeah, I've, um, I've heard that as well. Uh, a lot of uh, wives come out of there. A lot of military wives have come out of there. Yeah, uh, not just that anymore. Yeah. Um, and let's see. They were a territory of ours for a while. Yeah. Was it a territory proper? No, they were a protectorate. Yeah, that's yeah, what it was. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, that was when we were trying to like show some power off in that area. Yeah, it was a way of of, of putting a show of force in the in yeah. Asia, right? All right, so uh, the, the Philippines, uh, the part we're going to start talking about them is kind of the Spanish period, and we're going to go real briefly and move into the American period. But from 1521 to about 1898, uh, and that time period is kind of 1898, 1899, right in there. Mm -hmm. They're they're controlled by by Spain. They're a Spanish colony. And, and Spain probably had the biggest influence on them culturally. Uh, because of this Spanish period, they put the encomienda system in, which is a plantation system. And they okay? have amazing food. They do. They do. Sorry. Uh, but the encomienda system is a very, very class-based system uh, where – it actually became to where it, if you could trace your lineage back to, uh, to to Spanish lineage, you were in the upper class. If you traced it back, it, it's kind of like the Mestizos, Tejano uh, uh, system in, in, mm -hmm. in, in Latin America. Uh, but they were a very closed off system because of mercantilism. They were they only traded with Spain. Spain was, was it. Uh, in the 1800s, or actually 1763, the late 1700s, uh, Britain is going to come in, come in there, and they're going to, going to force them to open trade with the rest of the world. They're going to use military force against it, and that's going to kind of bring the Philippines to the uh, the eye of the world. Mm -hmm. Before this, like I said, they were they were this obscure island nation that was dominated by Spain. Um, but the U.S. is going to come become involved after the Spanish American War of 1898, um, which is one of the most imperialistic wars we've we've ever had. We, oh yeah, that was one of the things that Spain gave up to us whenever we won. That's right. Uh, I remember now. The okay. uh, if you remember, uh, we did a show in Puerto Rico where we dealt with this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but in the War of 1898, the Spanish American War, uh, this was a war ostensibly fought to free Cuba from Spanish dominance. Right. But the very first shot of the war to free Cuba was fought in Manila, uh, fired in Manila Bay in the mm -hmm. Philippines. And the reason why we did that is because uh, in order to get the declaration of war, there was this group of people led by Mark Twain called the Anti-Imperialist League who uh, said that we should not be fighting a war to colonize the world, that, that, right. that we should be anti-imperialist. And they would not support— Put another one down for Mark Twain, you guys. Yeah, they, wouldn't they would not support a war that would allow us to, to own— Cuba when it was over. Mm -hmm. So we passed something called the Teller Amendment to the, the Declaration of War that said when the war was over, we could not own Cuba. Right. 
but it didn't say we couldn't own the Philippines. So we went and went and, uh, since we were fighting Spain, we went and 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 took the Philippines. Um, literally, that that was the logic behind it. Um, it, it. The Battle of Manila Bay is one of the most interesting battles uh, mm-hmm. of of the war because it was it was only a battle kind of on paper. The uh, the U.S. under Commodore Dewey pulled up. Uh, with our, our modern Navy, the most modern Navy in the world, all steel, steam-powered Navy. And we said either surrender or we're going to uh, uh, put naval gunfire onto your capital city, on, onto mm-hmm. Manila. And the Spanish soldiers, in order to to save face, in order to, to, to keep themselves from being punished, uh, made a deal with Commodore Dewey that, um, that, that we will surrender in a few hours, but you've got to— uh, You've got to fire on Manila first. Mm-hmm. So we sat off the coast and we lobbed, uh, <laughs> we lobbed uh, bombs into Manila for two hours, and then the Spanish government surrendered. Uh, mm-hmm. It was actually an agreement because they had to be seen to have put up a fight, uh, and that was kind of how we got control of of the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we bought it in as a uh, as kind of a. a a protectorate. It's not a. It's not a true territory, but the U.S. is now now the protectorate of it. For a while there, George Dewey was the uh, the leader of this, and guerrilla warfare goes on for years in this time period. Uh, George uh, Dewey being the Commodore the, Dewey, the, the admiral, the, the the nephew of Scrooge McDuck. Uh, no, uh, but so Commodore Dewey allies with this Filipino hero Emilio Aguinaldo, and at this point. Uh, oh, yeah. Emilio Aguinaldo is our friend, and we sold him as as the Filipino Thomas Jefferson. Mm-hmm. That was literally what they said. Um, so we come in here, and and, and and he leads the guerrilla fighting against the Spanish on the, particularly on the island of Mindanao, uh, and we're we're just kind of providing at this point mostly uh, naval forces mm-hmm. uh, and advisors. It's it's the Filipinos doing most of this fighting. Uh, Interestingly enough, after the uh, after Spain had turned over control and pulled out, uh, Aguinaldo declared himself president of of the Philippines, and the U.S. said, "No, no, it's th- this isn't going to happen. Uh, you're not as re- we tend to do. You're not ready for your own government. We are going to appoint a a, uh, a protectorate government." Mm-hmm. Uh, William Howard Taft was the uh, the gov- governor of of, of Syria. <laughs> Well, and I, I think this is somewhat historic because Spain's not really known for pulling out. <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. Damn it, John! You're going to uh, kill somebody here. So Aguinaldo. I mean, the whole country around that. Aguinaldo, the the You're American, the French, the American Thomas Jefferson. Aguinaldo, the American Thomas Jefferson, decides uh, that his job now is to declare a guerrilla war against the imperialist United States. Mm-hmm. So now we have to redefine this guy. Um, so the so our top pick turned against us and started fighting us. That's right. That doesn't sound familiar at all. It doesn't sound at all like Iraq, does it? Um, or, you know, any, any, uh, uh, any number of other or Saudi Arabia or uh, uh, <laughs> Iran for a while. Yeah. yeah uh, Anyway, sorry, Nicaragua. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You took, I, I, I'll stop now. Um, You're kind of taking a tour around the world. Yeah, I am. I am. Uh, so, this Treaty of Paris acknowledged that the Philippines was independent of Spanish control, but part of the agreement was that the United States established a brand new country there, and we allowed them to to to, to, to have a a uh, a government. They elected their government. By the way, uh, I think it's a great irony. Anybody without looking to know what the date was when, whenever we established the independent country of, uh, of the Philippines? Uh, July 4th, 1909. 1902. Ah, But we did, we did pick July 4th for their independence day. Of course day, we did. Uh, just like we did in Hawaii. Uh, so July 4th, 1902, uh, it, it, we established a civil government. But at this point, we still have uh, – this, this amendment in the law that said that the United States could interfere uh, if it looked like they weren't protecting the rights of the mm-hmm. people there. Uh, now, a lot of the people that owned the, uh, the businesses there were American businessmen, mm-hmm. uh, much like we saw in Hawaii. Uh, yeah, that's what that, I was that, about that, to that, that kind of thing. point out. Uh, Aguinaldo was captured. Um, at, at the end of the war, there were 4,200 Americans that died in this war, and uh, – 20,000 Filipino combatants died, 200,000 Filipino citizens. 
it's a it, it, it's a it's a pretty, it's pretty fucking bloodbath. It's a pretty horrific, uh, pretty horrific war. Um, interestingly enough, the uh, we actually passed a, a law that the uh, even though they were an independent government, the Filipino flag could only be flown alongside the U.S. flag. Right. Uh, so so both flags had had to fly at this time. Um, so we kept this veto power over them, and this is going to last pretty much. From 1898 to 1945, that the U.S. is going to um, exercise this kind of power over it. Again, not an official territory, but an American protectorate. Uh, what do you think about what America's done so far? I'm, I'm a little curious. I mean, I mean, on the one hand, I, I want to, you know, give give the same speech I've given a million times on colonialism, um, but it, it seems textbook does that make any sense it does um and interestingly enough the filipinos actually fought alongside the united states in both well in world war one in world war two and later in vietnam they even sent some troops Mm -hmm. they fought along u.s uh u.s troops and all of these uh in fact there was a very racist idea the the during the during world war two we referred to the filipinos as and this is a terrible thing to say but we called them our little brown brothers um, and and that was one of the things that, that we were doing. Um, one of those guys that fought alongside the the Americans was a um, a fairly young man named Ferdinand Marcos. He uh, he fought as a guerrilla alongside the Americans. Uh, he was even possibly involved in the Bataan Death March. Now I say possibly because uh, some of these stories appear later on. Uh, what do you know about Ferdinand Marcos? Anything? No. Have you lost? Sorry. I was hiccuping and I asked that's, Alex that's, to mute that's me. That's beautiful. Um, sorry. Um, um, he was the guy who up until recent-ish was the dictator there, right? Until 86, yeah. Yeah, yeah, recent-ish. Um from 65 to 86, he's going to gonna lead the Philippines. He's going to be their president and then their prime minister. It's not like that's 32 years ago. That, that, well, that's in the, in the global scope, that's fairly Exactly. Yeah. We were talking about the 1800s not too long ago. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, Ferdinand Marcos uh, proved himself to be a, a, a powerful soldier. He was known for being, uh, being a great combatant, for leading these guerrilla forces, and he tied himself very close with the United States, even after the 1945 uh, complete independence and where, where, where we kind of pulled out. Uh, in the 1950s, communism begins to, to rise pretty heavily in, in the Philippines, and there's this fear of the Philippines falling to a communist revolution. Mm-hmm. So what's the U.S. going to do in the 1950s? Interfere. We're going to interfere. We're <laughs> Sorry, to... intervene, I think is the word. Do we're we go... find oil there? <laughs> no, no, no. No, but it's on the way to oil. We found, we found, we found communists there. Uh, so so we, we went into their uh, interest of fairness. Like people oil. My, my grandfather was in the Bataan Death March in the Philippines. So he was a prisoner of war in the Philippines. Hmm. Um, uh, that he survived it, although he got a disease that, that killed him later on from it. Oh, really? Uh, but uh, so this guy is is known for for using extreme violence. Mm-hmm. Ferdinand Marcos in this time period, um, he starts to come to power as uh, as a young man in this new government who was willing to use violence to put down uh, uh, communism, and he was praised to the uh, nth degree by the. Uh, by, by the U.S. government, so much so that in 1965, he is elected the 10th president of the Philippines. Um, he is going to come to power in a time period of extreme instability in the Philippines. Um, the Philippines was, uh, again, communism was, was, was on the rise. The, uh, they had broke with the Catholic Church. They had formed their own religion, the, 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 the Christian Church of the Philippines, which is like Catholic light. It's, uh, the, it, it's, it's all the vestiges of Catholicism without the Pope. They have their own bishop that's, that's in charge. Uh, by the way, that, that particular branch of the Christian Church has since recognized Ferdinand Marcos as a saint. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah he's, uh, there, there's that. a, there's a uh, uh, whole religious group that worships uh, at the uh, temple or the church to to Marcos now. And it, what is he the saint of? Uh, saving the Philippines uh, from from communism. Um, 
So he's he's an interesting. On the nose. He's a he's a really interesting guy. He uh, he comes to power in a in a time period when when it's very unstable and so so unstable that that there was a, a an attempted coup d'état against him. They tried to overthrow the government, and he's forced to declare martial law, and he takes on absolute power, the powers of a dictator. He, he retains the title of president, but he is, for all intents and purposes, uh, the dictator of the Philippines at this point. Uh, he puts in term limits for the president. He puts in great limitations of power for the president, but he exempts himself from both because for the time being, it's necessary, he says, for, for him to have these powers uh, in order to stabilize so the future Philippine government can be democratic and free. What do y'all think about that idea? Does it sound at all familiar to anybody? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I disagree with him from from a standpoint of of his own exceptionalism, which, which we see all the time with with dictators rising to power. Um, that they recognize the problems but see themselves as exceptional, much like America has done over many years with with the idea of yeah. American exceptionalism. Uh, however, you know, I can't completely not praise the, the measures that he's going to, that he puts in place, you know, now not abiding by them, uh, is problematic for sure. But I mean, I, I have to say these are good ideas. Does, it, does this make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, I, I think there, that some, I think there is some truth though, to the fact that there's that, that between governments, you have to have something there with, with, with a strong government. Uh, you can't. You might call it anarchy, well, or but but you can't go directly to pure democracy. I, even our own founding fathers went through the Articles of Confederation period before they went to the uh, the Constitution period. You can't. You end up with king mob if you go all the way. Yeah. Uh, here's my problem with it is is Marcos does it in the middle. He doesn't do it at the beginning. Yeah. He does it in the middle of this this experiment. Um, let's get to know a little bit more about Marcos because so far he just sounds like a typical. Uh, uh, Bureaucrat, but um, Ferdinand Marcos. To give you an idea of what kind of person this was, back in the 1930s, when he was still a boy, in 1938, he was accused of murder. Uh, he was prosecuted for the murder, and I can't say this guy's name, Julio uh, Malindishan. I can't. I don't know how you pronounce yeah. his name. Uh, he who was a political rival. He was running for office. He was accused of murder. He was put on trial for the murder. He was convicted of the murder and sentenced to death. And then the Supreme Court of the Philippines uh, came came down, reversed the decision, and uh, he instead of going to prison and, and dying, he got elected to uh, to, to government to a government position for this what? because they saw him as strong on law and law and order. Yeah. At no point did Marcos say I did not kill this person. All the way through, his defense was it was he needed killing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I did it for the people of the Philippines. Which is an idea that you see, you sort of see a, a thread tied through in the Philippines with their leadership. Yeah. Like this. Um, so in the 1970s, um, he was challenged by a guy named Aquino for for the presidency. And it, it, it looked like he was going to uh, going to lose, lose the presidency. Um, and then Aquino was assassinated. He was murdered. Okay, so that was not the Aquino that followed him. No, this is going to be a different one. Uh, the Aquino was assassinated at this point, and Marcos was the last man standing. He is he is reelected president. Uh, all evidence shows that it was government kill squads under Ferdinand Marcos that killed him. Um, in 1986, Marcos is finally ousted from power by a, by, a, by a popular revolution. They they moved moved him from power, um, and Aquino's wife, Corazon Aquino, is elected president from mm-hmm. this at, at this point. So he was replaced by the widow of the man that he had uh, gotcha. had had assassinated. That's who you're you're getting uh, confused about. I am I am oh, I absolutely sure she was completely merciful on him. Uh, he was gone. He fled the country uh, under the protection of the Reagan administration, who, uh, uh, by the way, had had, had praised uh, uh, Marcos a great deal for his his uh, fight against uh, against communism. Oh, um, and he fled to Hawaii, uh, where he where he ended his ended his life there in Hawaii. Um, See, kids sometimes crime can pay, uh, and 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 it and it paid good, according to the Presidential Commission on Good Government. The Marcos family stole. Somewhere between five and ten billion in U.S. dollars from the Filipino government whenever they left. Good lord! And that was in 1986 dollars. <laughs> okay, so 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 here's my thing, right? 
while most time crime doesn't pay, if you look at like the payout, if you do win, it's it's, it's almost a good bet at this point. It's a good bet. <laughs> yeah. It's a good bet. Uh, since then, the Good Government Association has looked at things, and they believe that the communist threat in the Philippines was, in fact, a false flag mission by Marcos, and that there was never truly a large communism movement in the Philippines, that it was uh, orchestrated as a way to gain power. So it, it would be like if, if some entity went through and like made you know fake facebook ads and like you know <laughs> tried to show this 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 really hostile uh, uh you know opposition that is later shown to to be you know almost non-existent check out our episode on false flags yeah yeah um so you've you've, you've got this guy who uh during his time in, in in the uh in the presidency and later the prime ministership of of um of the Philippines, uh, stole somewhere between five and ten million uh, dollars. Uh, billion, million. Bi- billion dollars. Assassinated uh, <laughs> at, at least two political rivals, and uh, I didn't mention his war on the uh, uh, radical Islamists in the Philippines. He created concentration camps. Now, not death camps, but he did have concentration camps where he oh, rounded maybe they were having trouble concentrating. where he rounded up the, uh, the 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 Muslims in this area and 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 put them uh, in these camps. This was kind of hard to concentrate when you're being tortured. Well, this was in the 70s and 80s, and in 1981, Vice President uh, George H. W. Bush praised Marcos, saying uh, that he was a hero to our democratic principles and to the democratic process. Um, so he is uh, he has been a, a he he was without a doubt. An American tool, right? Um, with the removal of him, we saw uh, we saw something interesting happen in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines became much more politically stable. Mm-hmm. It became much more democratic, but the crime rate exploded. It became the single most dangerous place in uh, in Asia to mm-hmm. to live, particularly in Mindanao. Very very dangerous. So you could argue. That uh, that Marcos was a law and order uh, president. The crime rate was much much lower under Ferdinand Marcos than it was after Ferdinand Marcos. Mm-hmm. But the freedom index was also much lower under Marcos than it was after. Right. So what do y'all think about that? Is uh, you, you know is 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 that a a uh, trade off that's fair? Because there are there are a lot of people in the Philippines today still that praise Marcos because they go it was safe. Yeah, I get that. Well, and. Um, when people were turning to Duterte, um, after he was mayor of that town, um, they were likening him to Marcos a lot. Yeah, they were. And, um, and they were trying to solve what they saw to be, um, a huge problem with violence and crime in, in the Philippines. Um, but I would argue that while there is some, uh, immediate response in that change of power with regard to crime rates and everything, I think one of the things that you have to consider with that is the amount of turmoil that the Philippines had been going through for the last hundred years Yeah. Um, that I think was inevitably going to lead to higher crime rates unless you literally had Gestapo walking through the streets like murdering anybody who looked him in the eye. That's a good way to keep crime down. It well, is. And, you know, one thing that, that uh, uh, statistics and history show us over and over is that the main driver in crime is not a lack of law and order. Uh, the main driver in crime is economic hardship. It's, it's poverty. poverty. Yeah. And so then I have to ask why, and, and we, we know this to be a fact. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not just like drawing something out of thin air to, to prove my point, but why were, why was poverty so prevalent in the area when he left? And did he have a hand in that? And, and could then, it have anything to do with the billions of dollars he stole? Or yeah. could it have anything to do with mismanagement? Or could yeah. it have anything to do with trying to keep a population uh, completely unable to fight back? And if we look at those factors, and we, we do pin it back on him, th- or even the U.S. Or in, us, in, in or the way Spain, that, that or we, Britain. You know, there's yeah. plenty of blame to go around. Then, then, then do we get to really look and say uh, that, that he's the hero of the story? You know, it's kind of like... Yeah, he broke our legs, but he gave us this nice crutch. You yeah, know? yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
but but like we have seen before, we, we have seen cases even in our own country mm-hmm. where we can we forgive abuses of power because because you know, they keep us safe. They keep us safe. Patriot um, Act. You know, while I was reading this uh, about this, I kept thinking to myself of my buddy that lives in Las Vegas that tells me all the time uh, that it was it was much safer in Las Vegas when the mob ran things. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, to me, this is a lot like the mob running things, yeah. um, and it's kind of kind of similar to it. I want to move into Rodrigo Duterte uh, because he's kind of the next big leader to come out of there that we're dealing with. But we need to talk about this beer before we do that. Thank so, you. Um, who would like to start our discussion on this Adelbert's beer? I'll, I'll go ahead again. So before I start talking about the beer itself, I, I do want to to mention some things I've noticed on the bo- on the Kay. bottle. Excuse me. So it's called Triple B. I realize now that actually stands for something. Uh, it stands for Bad Boy Brew. Yep. Oh. So, and I want to read this little story. I'm, I'm doing it from kind of an angle so I don't spill this beer, but so bear with me here. So the story of the beer. Dale was one of those mischievous young men who liked to push the social conventions of the 1970s. His college God years damn. were a whirlwind of girls, parties, road trips, and an occasional study session. I thought those were the social conventions of the 70s. He pushed them. He like, you know... Hoorah. Yeah, he, he pushed them to their limits. I guess he, it was the occasional study session that... Uh, yeah, but that was that was a little too far. <laughs> he was a bad boy with a great heart and knew how to have a good time. Whenever, wherever he was... Uh, he knew how to have, have a good time wherever he was making friends far and wide. So that is, you know, uh, this beer is, is, is dedicated. A tribute. Yes, a tribute. It's called Bad Boy Brew. I want to talk a little bit about these flavors because I think they hit the description on the nose. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the L itself... Yeah, when I think of a triple, of course I'm going to tend to think of a Belgian triple. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't fit quite right. Right. So go right. ahead. So this complex straw-colored L has clove and pear aromas... Uh, a marriage of spicy and fruity notes uh, help perfectly balance its <laughs> elegant malt profile. Pair with rich foods like steak, roast, earthy cheese, and cheesecake. Hmm. So interesting. interesting. Talk about what a triple is again, just for our audience. Yeah. So, so a triple is 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 a Belgian rating scale. So they had singles, doubles, triples, and quads, and it just talks about the the amount of flavor that is contained within a beer. Um, Either Anna thinks I'm an asshole or has something to say. I'm not really. I just, I, I'm just I, waiting. I hope people are watching this on YouTube because I don't know if Anna meant to or not, but she just went to scratch her neck and shot me the bird. <laughs> yeah. It was. I'm, I'm looking to you. She really? Thinks, I'm an asshole. She's flipping you off. <laughs> what do you want, Anna? I was going to let you finish. That's it's, what this is for. The, are you this is your cue. What do you yeah. want, Anna? Um. So I, I, I think that perhaps this beer was mislabeled. Um, they spell it T-R-I-P-E-L, um, which tends to indicate the Belgian triple, yeah. quadruple, yada, yada. Um, but I think their their labeling seems to be that they're trying to indicate that there are three Bs, bad boy brew, whatever. Um, but this is not a fucking triple. Okay. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I, I would disagree with you on that. Would you? Um, it's it's not going to have that, that, that more sweeter banana flavor but it is it, it is a fruity uh, uh clovish flavor i think it's good i think it's different uh it if, is different if you brought me this beer i wouldn't mistake it for every other triple which actually in my book gives it points uh that, that they took a, a classic and that they did something awesome with it um it, it 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 does it hits pear on the nose uh it's got those clove flavors it could be better i mean it's it, it's not the best thing ever but I, I think that they have something good here um, in, in true Adelbert style, uh, and I'm going to give it a 3.5. A 3.5. Right. You or me? Go ahead. All right. Uh, I don't think it's a triple either. I don't I, – I, I think it's I, – I don't think it's um, – I'm probably looking for the wrong thing. I don't think it's heavy enough for that for me. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. It needs um, more body, more yeah. richness, more oomph. That having been said, I think it's a problem of uh, of expectations more than it's a problem of the beer because this mm-hmm. is a really good beer. Yeah, um, I, I've I've enjoyed it a great deal. I had to get one more drink real quick to, I before I did this. Um, it's got an interesting curve to it. There, uh, it does have that bell curve where you get the get the high in the middle, but the high is the high is not 
uh, extremely heavy. It's it, it, it's a small curve. Mm-hmm. Um, it does hang on your on, on your taste buds afterwards mm-hmm. for a while. When you finish drinking this, you can still taste it for a minute or two afterwards. I like that. I do. It's taste, a pleasant. Aftertaste. It, it is. I do taste the the the, the that banana aftertone though that, mm-hmm. that, that you were talking about there. That's uh, that that you might have missed. There's a creaminess to it. I mm-hmm. like. Um, it's um it's got a it's got a good mouth feel. Although it's it's a little thinner than I would like my beer to be. But I think that's that, that's what it's going for. I don't think it's I don't think it's missing anything in that. Um, I don't think I'm gonna. I, I'm not gonna hit hit this beer for anything. Uh, there's nothing on it that I think is bad. I don't think it's an extraordinary beer either. Uh, so I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna go fairly high. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go three even. Okay. Okay. All right. Um. So I'm gonna give this a three point two. While I don't think that it ticks the box as a triple, um, it is an a great drink. Um, I, I've really enjoyed it. It's, in fact, anybody who was watching the YouTube video, the first time that I sipped the beer, I made the weirdest face um, because I was not expecting it to be sweet. And while it's not overwhelmingly sweet, it was unexpectedly sweet. And I think that's a key difference there. Um, it's sweet, but it does have a, a nice... Um, not quite citrusy, but more like peachy, uh, tart tang to it that I really, really like. Um, not funky like a sour, but it is tangy, I think really is the best description for it. Um, it is medium bodied. Um, it's not going to be full bodied. It's not going to weigh you down. Um, it has a really great grain profile, I think. Um, so all in all, it is very <laughs> enjoyable to drink. Um, so with that, it gets a three point two. Okay, so a three two, a three zero, oh, and what? Three five. And a so three five. Yeah, but three three, three two. Yeah, somewhere yeah. In there. It's a pretty good, pretty good rated beer. Yeah. Uh, let's play really our is. game. Um, will this get you laid? I think so. Um, it does have a little bit of bitterness and a little bit of tanginess um, that. Maybe a turnoff for a few people will be a turnoff for a few people, um, but by and large, this is a good beer, and I think yeah, if you don't if you don't like that that abrupt bitterness there or, or, or sweetness, it's not going to be your beer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but I, I do think that this is the sort of thing that will push you over the top. Um, this is the sort of thing that can seal the deal for you. And and it's a it's like a nine. I think I, I looked up so. It, it's not quiet at Cosby Beer, but it's it, it, it's yeah, it's, it's pushing area. it. So be careful. I'm curious, would your would, 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 would your basic bitch like this beer? Oh hell no! I didn't think so. Which is okay. <laughs> That's important stuff to know. <laughs> so so as far as dates go, Wayne needs to know whether the basic bitch is going to like this beer or not. Well, he, he's over there. He's over there dying if you must know because he just got our Cosby Beer thing. There was like a problem <laughs> where that didn't hit him. But uh, but anyway. So as far as dates go, uh, I'm gonna put this as a special occasion beer. You could even use this as a first date beer. I don't That's think just it's just like what John always goes with now. What special, special occasion? No, beer. Uh, this is the first one I've used in like months. No, what do you <laughs> no, mean no? Not. Okay, which one? Name a beer. Uh, all of them. All of them. All so the last them. one. The last, <laughs> last one. I don't know. Yeah, last week was. No, we got to do this. Uh, when you're like changing it up. Changing it up. You want that something new? That sounds like a special occasion to me. <laughs> oh, you're just changing words now. Okay. All right. Well, whatever. There was a flex beer. Is that a special occasion too? Sure. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. All right. I'm, this did start with like on like what number yeah, date? It used to be on a number. Now it's just yeah. Like, it was yeah. like first date, last date, second date, fifth date, whatever. But, but okay. If if we do it on the numbers, there's only four. There's first date, second date, third date. Nobody cares after that. And then there's breakup. That's all the ones you get. Yeah. I- all right, all right. Anniversaries. Anyway, yeah. All right. So anyway, that said, this is a special occasion beer. You could even use it as a first date beer. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to r- rise to the, the the level of a Hail Mary beer to me. Yeah. Um, but, but you know. All if right. you secretly found out that she is a craft beer person and you want to impress her, like, get this, I think. Yeah, I think there's more impressive things you can get for a craft beer person. But, but if this not, is available. Not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on, on, Take on, her to Adelbert's if you're around there. On on my level uh, of lawnmower beer or not, I'm going to have something interesting here because I don't think this is going to be the beer that most people want to mow their lawn with. But 
I would mow my lawn with this beer because it's in the heat of the summer. I think it would be refreshing. It's uh, it's 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 very you know it's pretty heavy pretty heavy uh heavy beer with what nine you said yeah uh so so I would probably mow my lawn and trim my hedges with the lawnmower if I did this but I would do it I would I I I, I would drink this while mowing the lawn um I don't know would you would, would you drink this while mowing the lawn um. John says I wouldn't mow the lawn. So uh. yeah, I don't. So, so the last time I tried to 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 mow the lawn with a beer was a bad experience. For me. So, so tell that story. So I engineered out of a coat hanger a beer holder that mounted on my lawnmower, That's and so I quickly found out that the vibration of the lawnmower will completely decarbonate your beer rather quickly, as well as splash beer everywhere while you're mowing. I'm so, talented. See, I can I can I can hold it with one hand and drive with the other, so I don't. Well, it, it was a push. a push mower. Oh no 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 <laughs> no! I, I don't push mow lawns. Okay, all right. Um, so that kind of gets us through our our uh, our little game there. Yeah. Let's talk about this guy Rodrigo Duterte a little bit. I got it right. You did. Uh, Duterte is born in 1945 on the island of Mindanao. Now that's going to be important because that's. You know, Mindanao was kind of the the focal point of World War II. He's going to be in the area that was that was the most destroyed in World War II. He's born about the time that the U.S. allowed the allowed Filipino self government. Now they're still there, but they have elections, and his father is going to be in that first generation of of leaders. Um, when he's very young, they end up uh, moving to the, the the city of Davao, which is the, the biggest, most important city. It's the capital of that mm-hmm. province. It's uh, it's also the most crime ridden uh, city in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and his father eventually becomes governor of this of, of, of the province here. That includes Mindanao. Um, because his father was was uh, was part of this new government and 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 so successful and so busy. Duterte is actually raised by bodyguards. He's provided bodyguards because he's the governor's son. Mm-hmm. And uh, they make a big deal. There's a book written about him that I, that I, I read on a little bit. Uh, and they make a big deal about how the bodyguards weren't bodyguards to him. They were babysitters to him. Yeah. And, they were his nannies. Yeah. And, 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 and they taught him how to fight physically, how to shoot guns. And they they're the reason why he developed this tough guy persona didn't they like like they they treated this stuff they they had him do like kind of military-esque uh play exercises yeah, yeah, almost yeah the, he he when they would, would like, do their he was their mini their military boy yeah, he, he he ran through the drills with them yeah he did all this stuff with them uh and and he got a great respect for that that kind of attitude mm-hmm. and he was a tough guy yeah he got he got expelled from school twice he doesn't look like he should be uh, he did when he was younger fine he got expelled from school twice for uh, for fighting when he was in school his nickname if you translate it uh, that his father gave him was hoodlum okay shocker uh, because he was you know, he, he, he was this this kind of tough guy uh, in 1968 his father dies and Duterte decides to, to kind of change his life he goes to law school uh, now, part of the reason he gets to go to law school is because of his connections. But he's mm-hmm. he's now aiming to uh, to you know to go to law school and be a man of the law mm-hmm. uh, in, in in some some way form. Tough or fashion. guy with an understanding of the law. That sounds great. Uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, so he goes to 1968. He starts starts school. In 1972, Duterte shot and wounded a fellow law school student, who he accused of bullying him. Uh, he was never charged with the crime because of his. Uh, his, his political connections. And they since ruled then that it has, was justified. has had no remorse for it. No, he brags about it. Yeah. He, uh, he, he brags about it. Um, so he finally graduates from law school at the end of 72, becomes a lawyer, and he immediately goes on to become a prosecutor in Davao City. Again, the most dangerous city in, in the Philippines, uh, the murder capital of the nation. Um, there's all kinds of, of, of problems there besides just, just the violent crimes. This is the place where where Marcos's communist threat was was the strongest, and he's going to kind of fall under the uh, uh, I won't say control, but 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 he Influence. becomes a Marcos follower, mm-hmm. uh, a big supporter of Ferdinand Marcos at this point, and as a as the prosecutor here, uh, where, he, where he serves as prosecutor in Davao City from seventy seven to eighty six, uh, he brags about 
He brags about uh, his time as a criminal prosecutor uh, planting information mm-hmm. on people in order to get them off the streets. He says that these people were criminals. I knew they were criminals, and I did whatever it took to take them down. And because of this, he becomes a local hero. Yep. He kind of gets control of some of the crime. He puts a lot of bad people away, mm-hmm. a lot of murderers away. And he rides that in to the uh, the mayorship of, 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 of this town in 1988. This is where, up to this point, believe it or not, Duterte has been fairly normal. Mm-hmm. But as mayor of Davao City, he, uh, he creates what he calls the Davao Death Squads. Mm-hmm. These are police officers uh, and later on civilian militia volunteers who work for him. And they wear this, this band around their arm. Uh, and they basically just go out. They go out on their motorcycles with their guns. Um, and they just uh, kill people, anybody that is... Uh, um, that is accused of a criminal act. They're targeting, in particular, uh, drug users because <laughs> drugs are a big problem in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And his idea is that if you take the... Uh, if you eliminate the demand. If you eliminate the demand, you can get rid of the rest. Yeah. So he uses the Davao death squads on this. Um, he later on brags about personally killing a, 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 a drug dealer, mm-hmm. and he brags about it as he took, according to the the story that he said, he admitted Mm -hmm. to, he took them up in a helicopter over the bay in Mindanao and he pushed him out in the middle of the the bay and killed him. Yeah. Pushed him out of a helicopter. This is the way this mayor deals with crime. But he got crime under control. What do you think about about Duterte so far? I mean, I play Grand Theft Auto. I think we've all been there. Uh Uh-huh. But... He's there for seven terms. Uh, he he keep, keeps getting reelected. Uh, today, uh, the, the the United Nations believes that more than fourteen hundred people died to the actions of his death squads. Mm-hmm. Fourteen hundred people murdered by these these death squads. Um, let's uh, wait. Hold up. I I I don't want to <coughs> breeze over that. Fourteen hundred people. Like, let's imagine that a football game, or you know, like how many people are at a Cowboys game? Thousands. thousands. Tens of thousands. Thousands. Tens of thousands. So it's yeah. less than that. So, uh, you know. It's a, it's a good size high school football game. Okay. High school football game. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it'd be like dropping a bomb and wiping out a high school football game. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, however, they're all bad guys. Yeah. Well, they're criminals. How, how big? I, I want to. In I wanna, which the death, squ- death squads are both judge and executioner. Yes. 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 And so he's a mayor. How big is a geographical area? So is this, we're talking about Jacksonville? Are we talking about. Dallas, it's Houston. A, it, it'd be a middle-sized town. It'd be like a suburb of Dallas. It would, I mean, we're not talking about a, a massive city, um, it, uh, Davao City. Um, so okay, so it, it would be like a, a Fort Worth a population sp- of one point six million. Yeah. yeah not, so half the size massive. of Houston. Yeah, not That's, massive. Okay, okay. Uh, we drop a bomb in a high school football game. Okay. But it, so so this guy is is. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's going to ride this into national promise. By the way, he was elected uh, the international mayor of the year at one point over this because he dropped the crime rate so much in Davao mm-hmm. City uh, that he was, he was recognized as the greatest mayor in the world at one point. Um, amidst all this, uh, just to kind of, kind of get, to, get to know this guy a little bit, his marriage is falling apart. He'd he gotten married young. Uh, but but it's illegal to get a divorce in the Philippines. It's one of the few few countries in the world where divorce is completely illegal. Time to go on a romantic helicopter uh, ride. Uh, well, instead of I'm going to give him credit, he didn't do that. Instead, he uh, he got the bishop of the uh, of the Philippine Church to annul his marriage. Mm-hmm. So he didn't have to get a divorce because he was never married to begin with. Right. Okay, um, hey, you know what? Good for him. Uh, but let's d- kill less women because we need divorce. He, here's the deal, though. To do this, and this is why I wanted to tell this story, to do this under Philippine penal law, you had to have a psychological uh, uh, test. You had to be you had to be tested, and his uh, his psychological examination was leaked to the public, and it determined that he was a narcissistic sociopath. Uh, yeah, so like clearly. a government leader. That has now gotten Go out in the public, and uh, interestingly enough, he did not deny this. He, uh, he, in fact, he kind of. Made I'm po- sure he said, "Yeah, that's exactly what you need to be to run this shit." That's exactly what he said. He said, uh, "He said whatever I am, it's effective." Better than some leaders we have now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, all right. So well, they deny same. it. Same. Oh, okay. They so, deny it. Fine. He admitted it. So in 2015, uh, the mayor of the world uh, d- d- decides that he's... Bad when Duterte is more honest than the person running your shit now. <laughs> he decides that he is going to run for president of the Philippines. Uh, he promises. He only makes one campaign promise. Mm-hmm. He says, if I'm elected, I will execute 100,000 criminals and dump their bodies in Manila Bay. Yeah. Uh, this is his. This is his. His promise. You, you can watch the quote of it. How did the environmentalists feel about this? Uh, <laughs> there's none of those there. Uh, in May of 2016, he wins the presidency in a landslide, and he launches a war on drugs, where he brings the Davao City uh, tactics to the nation of the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Uh, he allowed police officers and armed militias or vigilance committees to kill with impunity. Uh, has a list of people, and and now the death squads are not just in Davao City. We now have thousands of these guys on their motorcycles going yeah, out slaughtering. I've, I watched a a thing where he was um, he was giving instructions to some of these people, and said, "You are now free to kill all of the idiots. Whatever you do in your official capacity is justified." In right. not quite those words, yeah. but that's essentially what he says. Currently, the United Nations. He did say all the uh, idiots, though. The United Nations now estimates that at least four thousand two hundred seventy-nine people have been killed by police operations as of May of two thousand eighteen. So that's a three. That's three years into his term. I don't yeah. mean to interrupt you, but I don't want to be explicit here. Yeah. Like you turned me down this beer earlier, and if you don't drink it, I'm about to. So do you want it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit, though. There we go. That's good. All right. You cool. Well, I'm it. taking the rest. Um, there's another 22,000 murders under investigation that are possibly linked to the death squad. Right. So we've got 4,279 people that are definitely killed by him. Another 22,000 that were probably killed by him. Yeah. 4,000 that years. were definitely in 20. So that's, so about one in six, we know were killed by, no, one in five, we know were killed by him. And 4,000 people, we, so that's... Twenty two thousand is like a Cowboys game, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's probably still less, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty pretty good size. It's a lot uh, of people. It's a lot of people. It, it's a it's yeah. a small town. Yeah, yeah, it's more than Jacksonville. Yeah. How, what's the population of Jacksonville? Sixteen thousand. Yeah, yeah. So like we wiped out Jacksonville. We're starting to leak into like Rusk and <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, so he is attacked by the international community and compared to Adolf Hitler. Now, we've right. seen this before. You always compare people to Hitler, right? It's always yeah. Hitler. Holy fuck. Um, There's more people at a Cowboys game than live in Jacksonville? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he Whoa. just realized this. So, I've never been to a Cowboys game. I've been to Jacksonville. I haven't either, but... It's so Sorry. Awesome. Anyway, go ahead. We, we were killing people here. So they, they've, they've compared him to Adolf Hitler. And I'll tell you, I, I usually immediately get mad when I hear the comparisons because there's, there's almost Because that is like the truth. most extreme. Uh, but in this case, they compared him to it and asked him about it at a press conference. And at his response, he said, Anna, do you remember what he said? Uh, or roughly, do you have any idea? Uh, not exactly, but in, in large part, it was like, well, I mean, yeah. Like he went off killing three million Jews and and fixed shit in in Germany and I mean if I could get away with that I totally would yeah he he actually praised it and I put the yeah. I put a clip of the video on here that if is you grossly want to, want to yeah, I, I can drop that in that uh, now Hitler massacred three million Jews now there is three million there's a three million drug addict there are I'd be happy to slaughter them. At least, if Germany had Hitler, the Philippines would have, but, you know, my victims, I would like to be all criminals to finish the problem of my country and save the next generation from perdition. Firstly, paraphrased. He, uh, um, instead of saying... You know, I, uh, uh, I, I'm i not Hitler. He came out and said, you know, Hitler was an effective uh, That's, effective yeah. killer of people. And if I could be that effective killing criminals, I would do so. So uh, uh, I think our producer has, uh, come on. Average He's got stats up there. Regular season home attendance uh, for a Dallas Cowboys game is 92,000. Good 92, Lord. 92,000? Yeah. That's yeah. the population of Tyler yeah. almost. Okay, so, so 
I got a question. Yeah. Y- you were talking about, and I think this is a very real thing. Yeah. The, um, like, political rhetoric of calling someone Hitler. Mm-hmm. Is it worse to be called Hitler because he's the known one, everybody hates him? Or is it worse to be called Mao because he killed more people and people don't know him, so it's probably serious when you say that. Like, you're making a comparison. Yeah, but, you know. Mao's okay. Mao, Mao, Mao's loved by the left. Nobody loves Hitler's, except for Rodrigo Duterte. <laughs> and that one guy who commented on our video. And the one guy. Uh, by the way, the go check him? out our American Nazis video. There was some guy who said Hitler was right. Go just have fun Let with him. Let him know. <laughs> <laughs> Let him and Duterte uh, know about your views yeah. on Hitler. Absolutely. Uh, so interesting. After he made that comment and after the death squads, uh, they they went through here and they, they did a poll. And currently... Rodrigo Duterte is at a 91% approval rating in the state or in, in the Philippines because crime's down, mm-hmm. and he has been praised by uh, two people that that, that 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 you have to know are, are, are mean you're a good guy. He's been praised by Donald Trump for his law and order policies, and he's been praised by Steven Seagal. So if those two guys like you, you've got to, you've got to be on the right side, right? I, I Steven some, Seagal, who by the way is currently under investigation for human trafficking. Right. I yeah. have something terrible. Yeah. We should go ask Ray his opinion on Duterte. Oh, that would be terrible. It would be terrible. He'd go, he'd go, he wouldn't know who the fuck that who? was. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. That, that kind That's of. That's our Filipino friend for anyone who didn't know. That kind of got us through this uh, <laughs> this discussion, mm-hmm. and I kind of want to want to close off by by asking the question. Do you do you think that that these pro- does the United States have a responsibility for these problems? Yes, but so let me let me okay let me let me differentiate two things right, and and me and Blaine actually re- recently had a discussion. Well, I say recently, last time he was around, uh, had a discussion on this. But I, I think there's a difference in responsibility and guilt, right? Yep. So you can be uh, uh, not guilty of something. For instance, if you're walking down the street, and to give his example, you find a baby in a dumpster, you're not guilty for that baby, but now you're responsible. Yeah. I don't think, and, and in this case is a really weird one, I don't think the U.S. is responsible for this. I think they're guilty of it. Does that make sense? Okay. It's not our job to go fix a it. A guilty party. But we did cause this problem. Does but that you, make sense? But you don't think that we have a responsibility to go fix our mistake? I think we've done enough. To I fix think, the Philippines. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> Every time we've gotten involved, we've made it worse. I think our responsibility is to stay the fuck out of it. You know what I think is I don't really know that funny? We've made it worse. I don't think we've made it better. So he has. It, it occurred to me he has a ninety-one percent approval rating. And and the thing when I was kind of looking at him was this motherfucker keeps getting elected. And I well, have like this light bulb go off. He's killing everybody yeah, who thinks yeah. he's doing a bad job. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, that helps. That, that definitely helps. It would. That definitely helps. And I suspect Duterte is not a young man. He's in his 70s now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's not going to be around a whole lot longer. Uh, uh, and, and I suspect that, that if we revisit this in a few years, there's going to be a church with his body in it like Marcos. And mm-hmm. there's going to be a... Uh, uh, you know, he's going to be a saint. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you ever get to watch that, uh, there's a... What's the? Uh, I was. I think it's the London Times did a, did a great article on, on the cult of Ferdinand Marcos, and you can look at it. And they they actually his body has never been interred. Marcos's body is in a glass case there, and and they they, they the miracle that he provided is that his body hasn't decayed, and that proves that he's a saint. So uh, there's a a whole religious movement around Ferdinand Marcos. My body um, hasn't decayed yet either. I want to go through and like throw like some fleshy bacteria in there. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> look what happened! Yeah, uh, just put Science, an air hole. Just put an air hole in it, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Something. So that kind of gets me through that through, through this. I was just kind of curious as to where we all were there at the end because yeah. I, I think we do have a responsibility. I don't think we should be going in and uh, uh, colonizing it, but I do think we have a responsibility to, you know, if. If there's a popular movement to remove this guy, we should, you know, be doing helping we can. But that's just me. I, I think things like providing asylum to people who are trying to get out of yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think things like NGOs going in and trying to remedy the drug problem through things like rehabilitation. Um, I think that is a good option. Um, but when I think of the U.S. getting involved somewhere, what I picture is that boat diplomacy. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think that's what we need to no, do. No, I, I agree. I agree. But 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 I, I I think it's irresponsible of us to say that we have no no uh, 
nothing to do with this now. Yeah. Whenever, you know, from 1890 to 1945, we dominated it. And from 1945 to, you know, today, we've backed bad dudes. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's... And I, I do get that. And, and I don't necessarily disagree with it. I just... I guess we're not good at interfering. We're not. No. We're really bad at it. We actually, picked the wrong actually, dude. We pissed everybody off. Actually, we're really good at interfering. We're just not we're, good we're at picking at, the right side to interfere with. Yeah. I don't we're know. not good at interfering. Unless we pick both sides. Yeah. But we're then not, there ends up being a third side. It's yeah. a whole thing. We're not good at interfering in a humanitarian way. Yeah. Yeah. That is we're true. really good at blowing shit up, though. Yeah. Yeah. We are. All right. Because we have the best bombs. We do have We have the mother of all bombs. Yeah, Trump? No, it's actually what it's called. That's Mo- the father Moab. of all bombs. <laughs> all right. So that's the end of what I had for this. Do y'all have anything else for us? Uh, I, I think we hit everything I wanted to hit. Guys crazy. Guys crazy. Guys crazy. All, both they, of them. They've had a lot of crazies. Um, and, yeah, and, right. and, and our presidents have, have, have been there with them. Yeah, yeah they have. Yeah. Don't do drugs. Wear condoms. Don't <laughs> lie. You know, yeah. the... General stuff and things. D- d- don't have, don't form a death squad. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Do, don't do form not, death squad. Do squads. not form a death squad. Yeah, don't do that. That's not yeah. cool. All right. Um, so what can they do if they want to uh, get more from us? So anyway, if you like this show, you can uh, hit the like button, the heart, uh, share, subscribe, do all the things, whatever it is on the format that you're watching this on. Um, you can find us on social media by uh, searching Six Pack Philosophy. Uh, you can get some super cool swag at teespring.com slash stores slash six pack philosophy. Um, don't forget to hit us up. We love hearing your show recommendations. We did one just a couple of weeks ago uh, from one of our patrons. Mm-hmm. On that note, if you like the show, you can support it financially um, for as little as a dollar a month or even just a one time contribution. For as little as $5,000 a month, you too. <laughs> <laughs> So for as little as a dollar a month or even just a one-time contribution, you can hit us up at patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy, all spelled out. And uh, we would greatly appreciate that. That'll help keep this show going. And maybe we can invest into some super cool things that the show can do. Other than that, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun, and we hope you have too. Cheers. 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 Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 